Hey everybody, this is Reverend Allison Gossett at Brentwood United Methodist Church, and I am so excited to be joined today by our senior pastor, Reverend Dr. Davis Chapel. Uh, we're doing a mini series on the meaning of Easter during this current time in the world. Each episode, we will be exploring a new question on how the gospel is relevant to us during this time. For more episodes like this, you can look up Brentwood United Methodist Church on Facebook, YouTube, or your favorite podcast app. Today, we will be exploring the question of what do you think the resurrected church will look like in the world post-quarantine? How can the people of Brentwood United Methodist Church or Easter people in general participate in this resurrection? Hmm. Well, first of all, Allison, it's good to be back with you. Uh, it was good to have that conversation yesterday, and it's good to see everybody um, who's tuning in today. Uh, we can't see you, but you can see us, and we're glad to be with you for a few minutes today. So anyway, so the resurrected church, uh, the question is, how do we, I think what I'm hearing is, how do we sort of uh, move into the post-quarantine moment that we're going to face uh, with our Easter faith, with the resurrection faith? Um, and boy, that's a good question. I mean, right now it's more about imagination in my mind about, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I think many of us are still trying to kind of figure out this moment, what felt like might be a couple of two or three weeks, you know, has tur is turning into two or three months. And so what felt like something that might just be a kind of a blip uh, on the radar now is becoming sort of a landscape, potentially a landscape changer with the way that we live in the future. Uh, and I'm hearing a lot of conversation. Um, certainly we're having this with our lead team and staff, but I'm also hearing from a lot of our people and people in the community, friends, about how this kind of event may, may shift us in, in ways that may be necessary. You know, one of the things that we talked about yesterday was you can't go back and live as though a crisis never happened. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes, sometimes we think like that, and that's really more denial than it is adapting. Mm -hmm. um, so you can't go back any more than you could, like with the Great Depression in, in the 20s and 30s, in 1920s and 30s. I have to clarify it now that we're in 2020. In the last century, you, you know, people who uh, went through the Great Depression and had to uh, had to learn to do without, uh, it, it reshaped their lives. They lived more frugally. Uh, they didn't have to have things that everything that they wanted. Uh, they seemed to be more content with what they needed. Um, similar with World War II. I mean, the whole country came together, was united in that effort. Um, and I think you could make a case for other crises like 9-11 and, and like this pandemic. I mean, what happens in a crisis like this is it, it, it gives perspective uh, to people, especially when it's a global crisis. You know, if it's just China or if it's just America or if it's just Spain or Italy, that's, that's one thing. But when you have a crisis that's happening globally, that's in 180 different countries, uh, that gives perspective uh, not to nationality, not to gender, not to regionality, not even sometimes to theology uh, or different theologies. It gives perspective to the most common denominator mm -hmm. that we are human beings mm -hmm. and that we are all made in the image of God mm -hmm. and that we're all loved by God and that we will all be sustained by God. And, and so this is interesting because this is the potential uh, for a crisis to reshape uh, more in a global way, not just in sort of my people or my country or my church or things like that. And so this is something that we're all going to be doing together. Now, one of the benefits of a crisis like that uh, is it, it tends to take down the walls between us. Uh, there's a deeper sympathy and empathy that can happen. You know, we hear people say sometimes, don't waste a crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, I've heard that politically. I've heard that in all kinds of ways, don't waste the crisis. But there is some truth to that. And, and the reason is, uh, when, when I, I'll put it in a personal way. 
when I'm faced with a challenge, when I'm hurting, when I'm in a hole, when I'm in a deep conflict, uh, I am at my most teachable moment mm -hmm. at that point. I'm, I'm then able to ask the questions to say, you know, where are you, God, in this? Mm -hmm. how, how can I how can I work through this in a way not that's just good for me? Mm -hmm. but it's obedient to you yeah. in context of loving my neighbor in my community, in my church, in my nation, in my world. Um, and so there's something about that kind of suffering that um, that we're we become more teachable, which is interesting because it's one of our core values as a church uh, is to be teachable, which is really what the word discipleship is all about. Disciple means learner or teacher. Um, now, the great thing is in this, in our story anyway, is that with Easter, um, in the midst of conflict or in the midst of crucifixion, or we'll call it the crucible of suffering, mm -hmm. God does his best work. It's interesting when you read the scripture that God tends to do his best best work in valleys, in cemeteries, mm -hmm. in our low points. Mm -hmm. and, and again, I think part of the reason is we're, when we hit a low point or a valley, all of a sudden we begin to ask the existential questions again. Where are you, God? Um, what is my role in life? What is my purpose in life? Mm -hmm. And when that happens, uh, what's beautiful is that God uh, God comes to us in those moments, especially, and, and that's what happened in the Easter story, in the worst that could happen, in the worst thing in the world that could happen, um, God shows up and redeems the suffering. Mm -hmm. Again, he doesn't, it's interesting in the story, like where Jesus appears to the disciples, uh, in, this is in John's gospel, it's like the third appearance of the risen Lord. He, it, the scripture says he breaks through the barricade. They're hiding out behind locked doors. They're fearing for their lives. And Jesus doesn't need a doorknob to get into their uh, presence. He breaks through the barricade. He becomes present to them. And the first thing he says is shalom. Hmm. It means peace. Mm -hmm. My peace I give unto you. And then to me, the most powerful part is he shows them his scars. Mm -hmm. Like he lifts up his hands. And there you see the nail scars. He shows his side, his feet, and he doesn't hide the suffering. He says, here, look at, look at it, see the scars. Mm -hmm. And then he breathes peace upon them. Mm -hmm. And what that means to me is in our Easter faith, you don't have to hide. You don't have to hide the pain. You don't have to deny, deny it or act like it didn't happen mm -hmm. because the suffering actually reshapes us. Mm -hmm. this, this is what suffering love does. Mm -hmm. It reconciles us. It, it redeems us. And then it sort of missionalizes us beyond ourselves to a greater good, to a greater purpose, to God's purpose for our lives. And I'm not sure there's any real way to validate that mm -hmm. or to, to actually experience that and find that except through sometimes the crucible of a crisis or a hardship you don't go looking for it you know it's not it's not some form of masochism it's not that right, right. it will come to you and when it does uh god also comes to you and so in the midst of that uh hardship as as the scripture talks about that god makes a way god is a way maker in the midst of what we recognize i can't do this I can't control this. Yeah. I can't fix this. And that's almost a relief to admit that, mm. uh, this myth of control. And so that leads to sort of a surrender to say, I don't have to fix it. Mm -hmm. I don't have to fix what I can't fix, what's broken. But I know somebody who can even use the broken parts and redeem them in a way that makes me actually stronger mm -hmm. uh, and then makes me nimble and pliable and maybe more useful mm -hmm. to somebody else. Cause I, I think of Henry Nowen, uh, who wrote the book, the wounded healer. Mm -hmm. I mean, what a title, we're all wounded healers. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is the thing that breaks our heart, uh, usually winds up becoming our ministry mm -hmm. uh, because we have such empathy and sympathy for that. And to me, that's, that's really the Easter story is that, Hey, we don't have to hide our scars, our suffering. 
um, because God can use them in ways. Don't, don't go back to try to live before uh, BC, before crisis. Uh, live in the light of Christ after that, even using the hurt and heartache as a way to, um, to be beneficial to others who are also hurting. And again, that, that call then is not to fix other people, it's to be with them. Mm -hmm. which, I mean, think of the word Emmanuel, God mm -hmm. with us. Mm -hmm. This is not about fixing, this is about presence, the ministry of presence, being with people, and the presence of God and God's people is reconciling and redemptive mm -hmm. in ways that, hey, there's gonna be another crisis in a few years. I hope it's not like this one. I hope it's not, you know, a, a pandemic, but whether it's an individual, a personal, a national, uh, an ecclesial crisis, or a global crisis, we're always going to face those hardships, uh, but we don't face them alone. And they become, uh, they become a means to shape us uh, with a greater strength uh, than before mm -hmm. the crisis happened. And you have to have a sense of, I think, of Easter faith, a sense that life goes beyond what we can see. There is resurrection. To have that hope uh, really enables you to face difficulty without panicking. It doesn't mean you're not afraid. It doesn't mean that you're not hurt. It doesn't mean that you don't want out sometimes. It just means you don't have to panic. You don't quit. You persevere. You endure. Not because you're great, but because Jesus is great in you. Amen. Amen. Oh, that was so good. <laughs> that's what I think anyway. Uh, no, amen. I mean, that's absolutely, I think what is happening for me in my own life is that like, uh, even though I'm not suffering too much in the sense of I'm not sick, my family's not sick, I'm enjoying family time. Like I just think of um, how much that this crisis even though I'm in that spot has like made me realize how much I try to control things in my own life, like even ministry or whatever it is, like how much I was relying on myself or trying to control it for myself. And yeah. so it's reshaped, reprioritized, helped me examine that and how much I'm relying on myself or my own intellect or my own, uh, you know, my own priorities and reprioritize like, oh, actually, how is this about God? Like, how am I living into how God's calling me and not how Allison Gossett wants things to go or what Allison Gossett wants, the, yeah. you know, those sorts of things. And just and it's that. Your, it's your faith that enables you to respond that way. Because mm -hmm. there are other ways that you could respond, mm -hmm. like becoming more controlling right. uh, would not be helpful to you. <laughs> right. Or to, or, or to our staff team or to our church. Yeah. But it is or not. My or my kids. <laughs> None of the above. <laughs> yeah, I'd be saying your poor kids. <laughs> well, and it's so interesting when we think of a resurrected church to what you were talking about um, walls and uh, realizing the common denominator of we are all human beings. It's like it reshapes that priority of like what is church. And church is not about the walls or the building. It's about the people. Yes. So like how it, are we as a resurrected church after um, all of this going to remember yes. that the church is the people and yes. God being present, Jesus being present, Holy Spirit being present with the people in ministry That's with each point. other. Um, so That's anyways, I'm going to try to hold on to that. Yeah. That's good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah. Want to close us in some prayer, or did you have a last thought? You can. No, no, no. I, I think I think our prayer should be our last thought. Okay. Let's pray. Lord, I pray for every person that's listening today and watching. I give you thanks for uh, the privilege that's ours to be together in uh, in a way that we've not been together before. Uh, we give you thanks for technology. Uh, to be able to see and experience, even though we're distant from one another, we feel very connected and we feel connected to you. We thank you, Lord, for our Easter faith. We're so thankful today to know that Easter is not really a date on the calendar. Mm -hmm. It's an experience in our heart mm -hmm. and it goes on and on and on. And the fact that we can 
go deeper and deeper in our love for you and experience your presence in our lives every day, every hour. It just gives us such great hope for the future. We thank you, Lord, for the way that you use hardship and suffering. Uh, we, don't, we don't sense that you caused that, but we, we know that you're able to use that in ways that are reconciling and redemptive and that shape us in ways that enable us to fulfill your purpose in our lives. And for that, we're eternally grateful. We thank you for the body of Christ. We thank you for all of those uh, this day who are serving uh, others, who are loving their neighbor and finding ways to, to be connected uh, to people in need. We pray for, for all of those persons, and we ask that you would continue to bless us, to be a blessing for you in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. See y'all later. See you later. <laughs>